Hello everyone, and welcome to another video. This video is another tier list, but for a game that one might not expect, Beast Bermuda. Now I know that this is basically the sequel literally nobody asked for, but I'm making it anyway because I am of the opinion that Beast Bermuda is criminally underrated. This is because, out of all of the Dinosaur Survival games out there right now, I think Beast Bermuda holds the most water, both figuratively and literally. Now, I'm not going to deny its flaws. The graphics are very meh, the optimization is terrible, the UI is cluttery and can be confusing for a new player, and the customization is... questionable. But I still think Beast Bermuda is a great game despite these flaws. What I like most about Beast Bermuda is that there's a lot going on at any given time. Beast Bermuda just seems like a textbook example of a wild land where everything is trying to kill you. You got the numerous predators, herbivores that are always pissed off, you might not even be able to drink because that one asshole sauropod drank up the entire lake you were trying to get to, and you might just get Ocean Man by a Mosasaur. Ocean Man, take me by the hand, you could also be experiencing a light rain that turns into a storm and the entire island is underwater. Also, a tip from me to anyone starting out, always spec into max weather resistance, for the love of god. The game also gets my praise for actually giving players goals that they can work towards. You can progress your dinosaur down the talent tree, you can get your own high score through survival points, you can see just how big you can get, and you can nest with other players. The game is a lot of good fun, but also has a lot in general. To a new player, all the mechanics and creatures can be a bit daunting, so it can be important to know what creatures you'll be up against. I say creatures because this time around, we're not just going to be looking at dinosaurs. There's pterosaurs and marine reptiles too. If you want to know about what I think about the game balance-wise, it's mixed depending on how you look at it. On one hand, everything in the game is viable, and I'm not kidding. You could go as literally anything and it'll be an alright choice. In Beast of Bermuda, there is no bad picks. This balance in stats and counters kinda gets eliminated with issues and growth though, which I've discussed previously on this channel. However, in overall balance, it's hard to say if it's an issue if literally every creature can take advantage of it. There's some that exploit it better than others, but we'll get there when we get there. It's important to note that because of the game's balance, the talent tree, growth, and player experience all being factors that can affect viability, trying to make a traditional tier list is extremely difficult. There's also the fact that the game updates frequently with new content and balance changes. I've already had to rewrite and redo this video several times. It's gotten to the point where friends have said this video is a curse from me cancelling mistaken truths. As a result, this tier list will be a lot more subjective. Please keep that in mind. Also, a like and subscribe would be appreciated, since this video took a lot of effort to make. So, without further ado, here it is. The tier list on Beast of Bermuda. So, looking at the start of this tier list, you can immediately notice some things that might seem off. The bottom is C, where are the lower tiers? They were removed for this tier list because, again, there are no bad picks in Beast Bermuda. All the creatures, in my opinion, are stupid good at best, and just mediocre at the absolute worst. So C is the bottom line. There's also a new Extreme SS Plus tier, and you'll see why that exists when we get there. To begin the tier list, we need to understand that Beast of Bermuda has multiple dimensions, or realms as I like to call them. Most prominently are the land and the water, with different creatures inhabiting both. There are also a select few that are able to inhabit both effectively, and for them, this is their main strength. However, I personally argue that for these creatures, semi-aquatics, this playstyle is more of a detriment than an asset. Although they are okay at living at both dimensions at their own will, they will almost always come short, compared to creatures that only focus on one. This means that semi-aquatics are generally outclassed by the more specialized creatures, and are sometimes stuck in situations where they have nowhere to go because of this. This problem might be reduced when more semi-aquatics are added, but there's no guarantee right now. In a world of multiple creature slots on a server, specialization is better than adaptability in this case. 
So, it is with this fact that I place Ichthyovenator in C tier. In a world of great picks all around, Ichthyovenator stands as the least good of the bunch. There might be people that are shocked at this, considering Ichthyovenator literally just got a model and animation rework. Don't get me wrong, Ichthyovenator's got a lot of good, fancy animations, which perfectly complement their Mafia Destroy All Moses persona. However, I couldn't help but be a bit disappointed in the update because of how it failed to change Ichthyovenator mechanically, which is where the heart of the problem lies. Keep in mind that I'm not saying there's anything really wrong with Ichthyovenator, it just feels... empty. And what I mean by that is that Ichthyovenator has absolutely nothing unique about it, outside of it being a semi-aquatic, and as a result, it can feel pretty irrelevant compared to all the other creatures. Let me put it this way, why would you play as an Ichthyovenator when Elasmosaurus and Megalosaurus both do what Ichthyovenator does, but way better in their respective categories, especially in a world where we can now have multiple creatures per server? Ichthyovenator really needs something to call its own, to let it stand out from the crowd. Until it does, it'll stay in C tier, which I hope will not be a curse for Spinosaurus, although it wouldn't be the first one. In B tier, we have the second semi-aquatic, Lurdosaurus. Lurdosaurus suffers from a lot of the same issues of being a semi-aquatic as Ichthyovenator, but unlike the fish hunter, it actually has some unique attributes to back it up. Unlike Ichthy, they also have the ability to herd with other herbivores. Being protected by more competent land dinosaurs means that Lurdus can expand their horizons greatly if they want to. Finally, and most importantly, they are kelp feeders. Now in some cases this can be a detriment, as it is the only plant they can eat, and it means that they depend on the water, but nothing else in the game eats kelp. It is a food source they have all to themselves, which is a major advantage. All these attributes put Lurdu higher than Ichthy, but it still stays out of A tier, since all these things don't completely save it from the problems that semi-aquatics have to deal with. Lurdusaurus shares B tier with a carnivore, Megalosaurus. Megalosaurus are a player's go-to when they want a generalistic, reliable carnivore. It is the fastest land creature in the entire game, which allows it to escape pretty much anything, while also having forgiving hunger and growth, making it popular with beginners. With great speed, stamina, and surprising agility for a large creature, Megalosaurs are amazing scavengers. Being able to traverse great distances quickly and efficiently, going from one dead body to the next. There is no better choice for anyone looking for the safe carnivore playstyle. This all sounds well and good, so why is it B tier? Well, while Megalo is great at passive gameplay, it is not so good at actual combat. Some people seem to forget that Megalosaurus is a really large predator, being on par with the much more recognizable Allosaurus. However, in game, it is surprisingly weak. It is regularly punked by larger herbivores and carnivores, and Megalo has no consistent options in terms of creatures to hunt. Pterandons live in their own little world, Orctodromius have their burrows, Velociraptors are gods, and Pachys are complete crackheads. <laughs> As a lover of nature, I can't help but find Bob Megalos reminiscent of coyotes. Very adaptable, but at the same time not much of a threat and preferring to stay out of trouble. Pachys and Ories are probably a Megalo's most reliable options in terms of victims, but they're still pretty inconsistent, and very limited compared to Akron and Rex, for example. This is why Megalo is B tier. It is a great dino, but it's not as great as I think it can be. Our first resident of A tier is a change of pace, and one that you'll be finding underground. Orctodromius is the smallest creature in Beast Bermuda, as well as the most recent addition to the game. Orctodromius stands out from all the other dinosaurs due to its ability to burrow. And no, I'm not talking about just making a hole in the ground for you to hide in. I'm talking about building entire networks of tunnels underground, through a Minecraft-style Vox system, where Orctodromius can build their own shelter and dig up food and other resources. Hell, you can farm food in burrows. I am not kidding you, the dinosaurs have learned agriculture. It's actually insane to me how well thought out burrowing is, and just how powerful of an ability it is for Ori's to have. They can create their own shelter and food at will, meaning for the most part, they can survive in their own little world free of danger. The only exceptions are floods and the occasional invaders, but they'll get stressed and are generally weaker in burrows anyways. 
It is important to say, however, that the gig Ori's have is far from perfect. Having such a valuable ability comes with big weaknesses. Because they can't get water in burrows, it does mean that they can't just live in them all the time, and do have to regularly come to the surface. This is where Ori's are at their weakest. When not in their burrows, they are pretty pathetic. They are slow and do pretty poor damage, meaning that for the most part, they are easy when caught out. The one trick Ori's do have up their sleeve is Pocket sand. where the attacker is blinded and their mobility is limited for a time. Ori's also have the problem where, despite being quite small and secretive, they are surprisingly easy to track down. As Ori's dig their burrows, they dispose of the excess dirt on the surface, which leaves a pretty noticeable dirt pile that shows where they've been active. Recently used burrows also leave a scent cloud that other players can smell. As a result, they are pretty popular targets for Velociraptors and Pteranodons, although other carnivores usually consider them too small to be worth it. Orchidromius overall is a great dinosaur, with one of the most unique playstyles in the game, even if it might take a bit to get used to. Let's move on to another dinosaur that is a lot more simple. I've said this before, but Pachycephalosaurs are just the crackheads of the Bob world. I've never seen such aggression and attitude from any other herbivore in this game, and they have a reason for that. The stats of the Pachy make them seem pretty weak, and in some aspects they are, but they make up for this with their insane charge attack. The charge does not do much damage, but it has pretty good injury and knockback, to where they can sometimes fend off creatures larger than themselves. While this isn't that insane on flat ground, Pachycephalosaurs excel best on uneven terrain. If you're a carnivore, and the Paki has the high ground, run for your life. Pakis are deadly when they have the momentum. At best, you'll be struggling to live, and at worst, you'll be launched into the air and will fall to your death. The fact that Pakis got this much ferocity, despite their smaller size, makes them my favorite herbivore in this game. The absolute mad lads. Also in A tier is the Parasaurolophus, probably the most well-rounded out of the herbivore options. Parasaurolophus has all of the tools that make it an ideal herbivore pick. It is the fastest herbivore in the game, while having the power and size to fight off Megalos and make Acros and Rexes reconsider their options. They also have an ability that is well wired to complement herd life, the ability to highlight any threat for the rest of the herd to see. It can also change between bipedal and quadrupedal, allowing it to change its mobility depending on the situation. Parasaurolophus has all the tools that make it a great, great A herbivore, while not being overbearing at the same time. Time to change things up with a pair of powerful carnivores. These two share the same role, but accomplish it differently. Tyrannosaurus is all about the large size and big damage numbers. There is no land carnivore that beats it in raw damage and health and this complements its high run speed beautifully. There is nothing better in the game at just blitzkrieging the opposition, despite its lackluster stamina. Meanwhile, Acrocanthosaurus is not as simple or charismatic, but I'd argue it's the better pick overall. While not so much better to where it makes Rex irrelevant, Acrocanthosaurus simply has more options to deal with the variety of prey that exists on Bermuda. The roar ability of Acro decreases the target's damage and drains their stamina. This makes the roar a great tool for catching up to prey in a pursuit, and can give it the upper hand in combat, especially against its much larger rival. The bleed debuff, unique to Acro, stops the target from recovering health and comfort altogether. This makes Acro an ideal wall breaker for the tanky herbivores that simply have too much health for things like Tyrannosaurus to usually punch through, like Cytania and Apatosaurus. Rex and Acro are brutal to get to adulthood, with their high hunger and weak juvenile stages, but it is worth it to those that can succeed. Before I can go any further in the video, I need to talk about the Aquatic Realm in more detail. The Aquatic Realm right now, despite easily being one of the most unique aspects of Beast Bermuda, is also one of the most disappointing and lackluster. This is because the Aquatic Realm absolutely suffers from a lack of playable options. With only three creatures to play as, this not only can make aquatic gameplay more repetitive than playing on land, but it also leaves the aquatic player base way too focused on countering and combating each other. On land, this isn't an issue because it has so many playables that it's impossible to account for all of them, 
making general survival much more important. Because the aquatic player base focuses so much on the opposition, it feels much less like a survival game, and more like a hardcore version of Fiend Grow Fish, just trying to grow to a large size and then having their Moza vs Chrono Kaiju battles while the Elasmos sit in a corner either crying or laughing or both. It feels contrived, and stale, and it's sad. Aquatic gameplay is by far the most unique thing about Beast of Bermuda, but it feels like it's being slept on by both the developers and the general community. Outside of making the aquatic environments not shit, there has not been a single meaningful aquatic content update in the nearly two years since the game came out on Early Access. I know Archelon is a planned addition, which I really appreciate, but the game needs more. What about my boy Temnodonosaurus? Or Dunkleosteus? Or Mixosaurus? Or the, the Sea Blimp? Blimp? We need more aquatics for aquatic gameplay to feel more fleshed out and more engaging to play. The addition of other semi-aquatics might help too, but I don't really know by how much. In the context of how aquatic gameplay is then, you might have gotten the impression that Elasmosaurus got the short end of the stick, being in a world where the only other inhabitants are giant carnivores. However, not only is this assertion questionable, but it also doesn't mean they're bad. At all. Elasmosaurus is rather pathetic in terms of health, but it has one major advantage. Speed. Holy shit, the speed. Being the fastest animal in the game, aside from Pteranodon, there is nothing that can catch up to an Elasmosaurus on the run, especially as they jump. This allows it to stay out of the way of basically whatever it wants, given it isn't snuck up on. However, don't be fooled into thinking that Elasmosaurus are cowards. They'll kill smaller creatures when given a chance, and are absolutely brutal in larger groups. You see, that ridiculously long neck that Elasmo has isn't just for show, as it gives it the ability to auto-target fish and enemies, allowing it to attack while staying out of range itself. In groups, this basically turns them into blenders of death for all but the toughest of creatures. Beware the noodle swarm. Chronosaurus, on the other hand, is the top predator of the sea, and also the largest and most powerful carnivore in the game, period. Chronos are behemoths that are built for hunting the Moses and Elasmos that it shares its home with, and it does so with deadly force. However, this is not a case of just big damage numbers and high health, like with Tyrannosaurus. There's a method to the slaughter. Chronosaurus lacks the signature dart move that literally every other aquatic and semi-aquatic has. This, combined with slow swim speed, means that it has no real options for escaping danger or chasing prey. Instead of the dart, it has an incredibly scary charge move, which can be quite hard to use effectively, but when it connects, it can be very devastating. This ability, combined with the fact that Chronosaurus can dive the deepest out of all the aquatics, gives Chronosaurus a rather unique playstyle. Chronosaurus is built to hunt down open ocean, with deep water. There, the Chronosaurus can dive down and wait for a silhouette of prey to appear on the surface, and when it does, it strikes from below, just like a great white shark. This hunting method is really engaging to play, and makes Chronosaurus one of my personal favorite creatures. It's sort of funny that Chronosaurus at launch was easily the worst creature to play, since there was no places for it to hide or ambush prey. But now that it does, it is an absolute force of nature, and I couldn't be happier. The final member of A-Tier is easily the most controversial on this list. Apatosaurus on Beast Bermuda has a rather shaky history in how well it has been balanced. People on its release have often called it overpowered, and it has received a series of nerfs that, leading up to today, makes whether they are actually strong or weak pretty questionable. There are those that think Apatosaurus is still way too strong for any singular player to wield, there are others that think Apatosaurus has been nerfed into the ground, and there are those that think they're just fine. Unsure on where to stay on this debate myself, I left a poll in the Beast Bermuda Discord to see what people thought for themselves, after the last set of Apato nerfs in the Earthshaker update. Just looking at the results, it kinda goes to show just how divisive Apato is. After reading more in-depth responses people have left for me, as well as my own experience, I think I can come to a conclusion. Apatosaurus is... just fine how it is. It seems to me that a lot of the issues people have with Apatosaurus come from scenarios and circumstances, usually outside of the creature itself, 
like Acros using their roar ability to cheese out Apatosaurs, and Megahertz making Apatos and those that they protect untouchable. So, let me tell you what makes Apatosaurus as a creature. Apatosaurus is nothing short of legendary in the flesh. They are the biggest and most powerful creature in the entire game. You can hear, see, and smell them coming from miles away, and they leave their impact on the environment wherever they go. They can destroy entire forests by eating and knocking down the trees, as well as being able to drink up entire water sources. Also, Apatosaurs are just so big that they don't give a shit about weather, including tornadoes. Carnivores also give them a wide berth due to just how powerful they are. Carnivores have to think about how they're going to attack these giants. Apatosaurs are so massive that often just their sheer size protects them, without even having to attack at all. The stomp is Apato's most powerful attack, but often just a light kick does the job just as well. The rear on the other hand is the Apato's main business end. The tail has incredible range, and has the ability to knock any carnivore out of commission very quickly. Apatosaurus also has some of the most well-rounded talent trees of any creature. Earthshaker, the ability to shrink the delay between the stomp and the damage. <laughs> Turn while stomping, be able to move while stomping. Shelterer, be able to give shelter to herdmates, take your pick. Apato has everything. Well, not exactly everything. Keep in mind that this does not mean that Apatos are invincible. Often kept out of reach, the Apato's neck is a massive weak spot if it can be taken advantage of. And Apatos also have a weak spot on the rear under the tail, which could be exploited given the Apato can be distracted or pinned into a more vulnerable position. Be warned that Apatosaurus also have the legendary ability to move backwards. Future. These weak spots mean that players that know how to deal with Apatos often can effectively, and large carnivores that have specifically specced against them are also very effective. Apatosaurus also easily has the worst start in the entire game, with juveniles being very slow, easy to spot, and unable to defend themselves that well. This is negated by protection in a herd though, which again stems from how herding in general is kinda shaky from a balancing perspective. Regardless, taking all the variables into account, I'll be putting Apatosaurus in A tier. Controversial I know, but this is an example of how this tier list is a bit more subjective. Speaking of subjective, with the first member of S tier, we go from the biggest creature in the game to one of the smallest. Velociraptor. Developers. Community. I am sorry, but... What the fuck is this? Never in my life have I seen a dinosaur in a survival game as asinine and ridiculous as the Beast Bermuda Velociraptor. Like, I I'm not somebody who is against dumping accuracy and going a bit lenient on the realism for a fun experience. Note that I didn't complain about a roar turning a dinosaur pink or a 4-ton marine reptile being able to jump hundreds of feet into the air. However, there's a line, and Velociraptor crossed it. A Velociraptor, a tiny fluff ball the size of maybe your dog at home, is capable of threatening entire herds of herbivores by itself and soloing rexes and acros. Like what the fuck, I've even heard stories of Apatos, Apatos, getting sold by Velociraptors. It is insane. Where is any sense of immersion, rhyme, or reason? I don't care if it's technically considered balanced. There's a difference between what is balanced and what is reasonable, and Velociraptor fails to deliver on the latter. Like, let's compare real quick. Here's a Packy and an Acro side by side. In terms of sheer size, Acro is around 12 times the size of the Packy. Okay, sounds a bit odd that a Packy might be able to take it down, but look at them. You can kind of see a Packy killing if it tries hard enough, maybe if it goes for the kneecaps or something. Still, it's not a big enough difference to where you can suspend your disbelief. Now, let's look at Acro and Velo. Jesus Christ, it's even worse when looking at the true size scale. Acro is over 200 times the size of Velo. A Velo soloing an Acro? That's some Shadow of the Colossus shit. It's stupid, and there's no other way to word it. It really feels like the devs were scared that Velo would be deemed pathetic, or get bodied too hard by other creatures, and ended up overbuffing it way too far. Don't believe me? Here's a list of all of the unique advantages that Velociraptor has. It has the smallest hitbox, the ability to find shelter basically anywhere, the best invader of burrows, 
extreme jump height, a pounce that makes it jump even farther, the ability to climb basically everything, near immunity to fall damage, the tightest turning circle of any creature, immunity to injury damage, seriously what the fuck am I reading? It has literally everything except for health. It shares some of these advantages with Ori, but Ori doesn't have the reputation for killing Rexes or Acros. Why is it okay for Velociraptor to be able to literally jump between islands and also have the ability to kill what to it or kaiju? Like, come on. Save this type of shit for you, Raptor, when it comes out, and nerf Velociraptor to where it's not able to inherit the power of both God and anime. The concept of anything being able to fight anything is something I can get behind, but again, it has a limit. Velociraptor right now is way too powerful, and as a result, belongs in S tier. Unironically, the best land carnivore in the game. Alright, sorry for the rant. But now, let's move from the best land carnivore in the game to the best herbivore. Cychania has a lot of great attributes that give it such a high standing. Cychania is unsurprisingly quite slow, and a horrible swimmer, but it is great at just about everything else. It has a monstrous amount of health for its size, and has the ability to cause recoil damage to its attackers, further emphasizing just how tanky it is. It also has an ability unlike any other, something all creatures in Bob are jealous of, the ability to turn in place. This makes trying to ride any part of its body suicidal. Instead, one must rely on hit-and-run tactics to ever hope to take down a Cychania, and this is where the tail comes in. The tail is what makes Cychania S-tier. Along with hitting like a truck, that club tail inflicts extreme amounts of injury damage. Not only is it extremely encouraging for anything that wishes to attack it, but the injury damage gets ridiculously high at greater sizes, to the point where a single hit can slow down an interloper so much, that it just gets run down and killed by the Cychania without much worry. It's brutally effective, a bit too effective, as is the nature of growth power creep. Cychania isn't the only one that takes full advantage of broken growth stats. Mosasaurus does as well. I will say, even without growth being in its favor, Mosasaurus is just straight up the best aquatic, even better than Kronosaurus. Now, I know many of you are like, didn't you just say Kronosaurus was the strongest? And I did. Strongest, gentlemen, not the best. Kronosaurus may be the strongest aquatic, but Mosasaurus has a series of attributes that make it much better overall. First off, the early game. Kronosaurus's hunger demands that it starts hunting for food from a younger age, which can leave it pretty exposed, as it's pretty much fucked the minute that it gets spotted by Moses or bigger Kronos. Meanwhile, Mosasaurus doesn't have to worry about that, since it can sustain on fish quite well until point eight and by then, it's large enough to hunt effectively. Playing Kronosaurus is a lot more skill-based, since one has to be good with aiming the charge and using stealth to play it the most effectively, being a stark contrast to Moza, which is a lot easier to just pick up and play with. Finally, the grab. Moza's grab does everything. Mosasaurus in Beast Bermuda has a role almost akin to a crocodile, where it can be in lakes and shorelines, grabbing whatever unfortunate soul doesn't see it coming in time. This means that Mosasaurs mostly don't have to rely on other aquatics for food, unlike Kronosaurus. The grab's damage is questionable, but its utility is amazing. It can be used to drown people, separate people from their group, or drag away a dangerous player from allies. The grab is insanely good, and in Giant Moses, it could grab things it really doesn't look like it should, like smaller apatos. It's kinda insane. Speaking of insane, we have now reached the end, with the final tier, SS+. Since there's only one creature left, I'm going to cut to the chase. The best creature in Beast Bermuda is... motherfucking Pteranodon. Pteranodon is the best creature in Beast Bermuda, by a country mile. It is amazing to me, how Pteranodon went from not even being properly playable at the game's launch, to having one of the best models and animation sets in the entire game. Furthermore, the flying is fantastic. It really feels like you're flying, being able to manipulate yourself through the air beautifully, while still feeling the resistance of the air and having to be aware of obstacles. 
I personally argue that Beast from Mutus Pteranodon might just be the best simulation of a pterosaur in all of gaming. Not much competition there, but still. In terms of gameplay, Pteranodon has it all. It is extremely easy and quick to grow, and the gift of flight means that it almost never has to worry about food or water, since it can cover the entire map with these. Since it also has the air all to itself, Pteranodon has very little in the way of things to worry about. It is basically the game's easy mode, to be perfectly honest. The only major threats to Pteranodon are rival Pteranodons, the occasional raid on the nest by Velociraptors, or getting surprised by a large predator below. As you can imagine, all these situations are, well, situational, and a Pteranodon rarely has to worry about death. Pteranodon's ease in gameplay is why I'm grateful Tropionathus will be added to the game in the future since it will give some justified competition to the current rulers of the skies. For now though, Pteranodon stays as easily the best creature in Beasts of Bermuda. Alright everyone, that was the Beasts of Bermuda tier list. Thank you all for watching. Tell me what you think down in the comments, since this tier list was a lot more subjective and had some pretty strong opinions. Since we've reached the end, it's time to give some thanks. Thank you all for 7,000 subscribers. This milestone really snuck up on me, and I have to really thank you all for being there for me. I've always wanted to make more extensive content like this on my channel, so I'm happy that my efforts are being rewarded. I'd also like to thank the following people for allowing me to use some of their footage in this video, since my computer was under some massive stress from all the recording I've had done to make this video. I'd like to thank the developers of Beast Bermuda. I have very strong opinions, which can oftentimes make me a pain in the ass, and I understand this. So, I was somewhat surprised by the universal support I've been given for my Bob content by the developers, who are even continuing the discussion down in the comments. With all the shit that's been going on in these communities and 2020, I don't think these guys heard enough. Thank you for making an amazing game that all dino lovers can enjoy. There's been hardships, and the game has had its lows, but I'm so happy that the game is getting better and is getting noticed. You guys deserve it. On that note, I'd like to thank you guys again for reaching the end of the video, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye everyone.